It's in Romans chapter 5 that I want to read from. Romans chapter 5, and uh, I, I think I'll just start reading with the very first verse. There is, um, when we talk about God, um, we can talk about, you know, what, what some people would think about first is what we do for God, or our love of God, our love for God. And then we can think about, uh, from a personal standpoint, our love for other people, that God kind of love that we are supposed to exhibit uh, to one another. But I think the most important one of all is God's love for us, because truthfully, uh, as Christians, uh, the way we interact with other people should be, and it's supposed to be a reflection of our relationship with God. So I would say that we need to understand more than anything else uh, the relationship that we have with God, which is based on God's love for us rather than our love for God. In other words, our love for God and our love for other people should be a reflection of our participation in a relationship with God based on his love for us. And I think that's the emphasis that at least Paul puts on it in the scriptures. Uh, I think if we got a good revelation of God's love for us and what kind of love it is and how, uh, how complete and full that it really is, how comprehensive it is, everything else would be easy. It would be, it would be it would, by comparison, it would seem uh, not such a hard thing to do. I, you know, I, I make mention sometimes of visiting with people and talking with people, and people have issues sometimes and things that are on their mind and they feel bad about. And I, I remember talking to a particular person one time who said, and I don't know, he didn't tell me the details of what he was talking about, but he said, I know, he says, we're supposed to forgive. And that's part of love. He said, I know we're supposed to forgive. Okay, I'm thinking to myself, where are we going with this? You know, I know there's going to come a punchline here. <laughs> I know we're supposed to forgive, he says, but I can't. Now, I didn't want to get into it with him and ask him what the details were. Uh, part of me was kind of curious, you know. There's a part of us, the kind of gossipy part, that wants to know all the details. But uh, I didn't ask him what it was. And he said, I know we're supposed to love, you know, even our enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. He says, I know we're supposed to love our enemies and we're supposed to forgive. He says, but I can't. Well, what are you supposed to say? In that? And I didn't say anything. I didn't know what to say in response to that. So he says, then next thing he says, so I guess I'm going to hell then. He said, no, no, that's not right. In his mind, his relationship with God was based on what he did. And if I don't forgive and if I don't love, then God doesn't forgive and doesn't love me. And I had to say, and this is what I'm going to say right now, no, God loves us first. And what we do in response is what we do in response. What we do it should be a response to our reception of God's love for us. And did you know that when the Bible talks about, and in the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul talks about, and Jesus too, God's love for us, it's always set in the context of uh, not that we deserve it, not that we are seeking him, not that we're repentant even, God's love for us is always set in the context of he loves us when we are completely unlovable. He loves us, he loved us when we were sinners, in other words. Not that he loves us when we're in church on Sunday morning, of course he loves us then too, but the, the emphasis is always put on the fact that his love is undeserved, it's unearned. He loved us before we even had any knowledge or recognition of him. When we were out doing our own thing, ignoring God, he loved us then. That's the context it's set in. And there's so much that we could read about this, it's kind of hard to uh, focus on the ones to look at. But this is in Romans chapter 5. And if you don't mind, I'd like to start there in verse 1. And again, Apostle Paul, it's hard to hook on with him because he always, he's in like, his, his epistles are like one long run on sentence. It's, every verse starts with and or therefore or something of that kind, for. This one is no exception. Verse, well, we've got to start somewhere. Therefore, he says, therefore being justified by faith. So what he has just got through, I, I suppose what he suppose he's proved in the previous chapter is that we are justified by faith. Or that is to say, we are made right with God by our faith in Jesus. Jesus has done the work and our part is to put our faith in him. So he says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it's easy just to read over these things as though it's just religious talk, but think about what he's saying there. It says, we are right with God because of faith, and we have peace with God, and it's through Jesus. He doesn't say what we would expect in a religious kind of sense to say. 
we have peace with God because we've made peace with him, because I'm trying to do better, therefore I have peace with God. No, he says we have peace with God not because of anything we did, because we didn't establish it. Jesus did, through our Lord Jesus Christ. But I've got to keep going. I could talk about that more. Verse 2, by whom, he says, that's by Jesus, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory, that is to say we boast even, uh, in tribulations, that's trouble. Uh, in other words, we, have, we can even have a positive attitude about trouble, knowing that tribulation or trouble works patience. And boy, isn't that the truth, you know? I mean, we were just talking about some things earlier, um, and, and Janet rightly said, God answers prayer. Yes, he sure does, but he sometimes takes his time about it. And I don't think it's that God is necessarily deliberately taking his time. I think it's just sometimes things take time to, to get there. But you know, God's got, uh, he's, if we want to talk about, now you can turn it down just a little. I think it's too loud now. It's something must have adjusted itself. There, that's better. God is the perfect model of patience. You know, there's, what comes to mind is that um, several places in the New Testament, I think there's at least three that say this, that Jesus, after he had uh, given his life and shed his blood for the redemption of our sins, after he finished his redemptive work, it says that he sat down at the right hand of God, henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. Now what that says is that after he finished his redemptive work, in his mind, it's all done. So then he sat down and, as it were, propped his feet up. <laughs> and he says, I'm going to sit here until everything opposed to me comes into alignment with me, until his enemies, that's another way of saying his enemies be made his footstool. In other words, until everything lines up with him. Now here we are 2,000 years after the fact, and I think you could look around and say not everything is lined up with Jesus and his point of view and God. Not everything is lined up with God. But you know what? He's got all the patience in the world. He's just, he's, it says he is henceforth expecting. I think, personally, I think that's, uh, that, that he stays in that posture. He stays seated until everything comes into alignment with him. Now, you might look around and say, well, it's sure taken a long time. Yeah, yeah, it takes long, it's taken a long time. But he's got all the time in the world. Now, we here, of course, are the ones who don't have all the time in the world. But he's saying here that this, we can even take uh, pleasure, he says, in trouble or tribulation because tribulation works patience. It helps us to... Be like God and uh, be patient for things to work out. And isn't it great when things finally show up, you know, when the, when the answer that we are looking for finally arrives? And we think, you know, if I'd known, I could have uh, been a little more at rest about this. Uh, but anyway, things take time. Tribulation works patience. Patience, experience. In other words, patience gives us experience and experience hope and hope you know what hope is? Hope is looking to the future with expectation of things turning out right. Hope maketh not ashamed. Now here's what I was getting to. Because, he says, uh, in verse 5, after the semicolon, because hope maketh not ashamed. In other words, we're never, that expression means hope uh, lets us know that we will not be disappointed. And he says, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now, I've heard this, ver th this verse preached a lot from the point of view of the love of God meaning some kind of a force by which we can love other people. We have the capacity to love other people because God's this force of love is installed in us, so to speak. I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think what he means by that is God's love for us is shed abroad in our hearts. He has poured out his love for us into our hearts. And the reason I think that's what it means, talking about God's love for us, is because of what he says next. Verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now when he says when we were yet without strength, he means when we didn't have any capacity to live a life that is acceptable to God. When we didn't have the capacity or the strength to do what we were supposed to do, what we would have been expected to do, when we were unable to do, uh, we might say, meet God's requirements, it says, in due time, again, there's that little thought there that there's a proper time for things. Uh, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Notice that he didn't die for the righteous. He died for the ungodly. 
Let me just point that out again. He did not die for the righteous. He died for the ungodly. Uh, we're told right here in the same book of Romans that there's none righteous, no, not one. So the truth is, everybody's in that category. And that's us. And we were without strength. And it says in due time, he, now this is still elaborating on the idea that the love that God has for us, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. That's how I know that that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about God's love toward us. He doesn't have anything else in view about love. He's emphasizing, and this is what I think we need to emphasize in our minds, God's love for us. And God's love for us is not something that's in response to our love for him or our actions for him. Notice he said that he loved us when we were without strength. He, Christ died for the ungodly. God commendeth, or in other words, he introduces us to his love, to the love he has for us in this, or in that, meaning here it is, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, he just got through saying, you could imagine a, scen a scenario where somebody might give their life for a righteous person. But God says, look, take a look at my love. I gave my life for sinners, for the ungodly. That means people who don't care about God. That means people who are ostensibly his enemies, right? People who ostensibly might be even resisting him. He gave his life for them. He gave his life, and you know where that is, of course, on the cross, where he gave his life. We know that's what he means, right? And I, I have something to say about that, and, but just save that in your mind for a second. God introduces his love us in that while we were sinners Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him wrath just means the just punishment for sins you know I know Christians and I've been in this boat myself who can imagine that God loved me when I was a sinner enough to get me saved but now that I'm a Christian he's really harsh and stern and severe you ever had that kind of thought cross your mind? You hear that church a lot, and preachers like to preach it that way because they think that's going to scare the Christians to living right. That's going to scare everybody to trying to do right. Listen, somewhere along the line, we've got to put a little confidence in the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in pe other people's lives. And aside from that, what that idea of scaring people and making them feel like God's mad and really stern and harsh you know, in other words, he'll, he'll give you a little bit of grace when you're a sinner, but now that you're a Christian, he's really harsh. It's false. It's untrue. It's a false impression of God. It is untrue. That's what Paul means here when he says, if Christ died for us when we were sinners, much more than, not much less, but much more, being now justified, and again, I think we read over these religious words and don't really think about what they're saying. Justified means made right. In other words, we're made right with him, we're in right relation. We have peace with God, not because we did anything, but because of his work, by his blood. Not our blood, but his blood. We, it says, much more than, now that we're justified, we shall be saved from judgment. You could read that there, wrath. Wrath means the just punishment for sins. I never have understood, and no, in one way I do. I don't now understand. I never have understood Christians afraid of you're worried about the judgment of God. Listen, God's judgment against your sins is accomplished. It took place 2,000 years ago. When Jesus went to the cross, he said, now is the judgment of this world. That wasn't me that said that. That's him that said that. Now is, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the prince of this world be cast.